pleasant and very warm greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on digital ID and EKYC for financial. S'appelle l'identification numérique et. Il a connu son client. My name is Adeyemi Omotosho. I'm the policy specialist for fintech at Afi, and I'll be supporting tonight's webinar. I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of Mr. Norbert Mumba, the deputy executive director of Afi. Thank you for joining this webinar. And to our esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Ramizul Islam, the Deputy General Manager, Bangladesh Financial Intelligence Unit, Bangladesh Bank. Mr. Yuri Bozo, Expert Group Leader, Service for Consumer Protection and Financial Inclusion, Central Bank of Russia. Mr. Marcelo Bellini Garcia, Vice President, Product Management for Digital Identity in the LAC region, MasterCard. Ms. Shana Krishnan, Policy Analyst with FATF Secretariat, and Ms. Kate Eagle, Director Ecosystem Engagement, Digital Business Unit, IDEMIA. And finally, we are also honored to have Ms. Sally Abdukada, the Co-Chair of the AFI Global Standards Proportionality Working Group, to provide closing remarks to conclude this webinar. Warm welcome to you all. Without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Norbert Mumba, the Deputy Executive Director of AFI, to give his opening remarks. Norbert, the floor is yours. Thank you um, very much, um, Adiemi, um, for uh, welcoming everyone and also for inviting me to uh, this um, 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 let me start um, by, uh, on behalf of the executive director and indeed my colleagues at AFI uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, important webinar uh, on digital ID and EKYC for financial inclusion amidst, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. So, I think as, as we start this uh, webinar, um, our, I also wish to take this opportunity to um, thank the working group uh, uh, chairs, uh, Ms. Carolina Pickering, uh, Mr. Sadat, uh, Ms. Kada, and also for the D Digital Financial Services, uh, uh, Ms. Mrs. Nadezhda, um, from the Central Bank of uh, Russia and Mr. Nasa uh, for uh, the hard work that the team has put into, into all this. And of course, my colleagues, uh, Gears and uh, uh, Robin, uh, who are in charge of the respective uh, working groups for uh, the excellent effort. So let me uh, straight away uh, uh, get into a few thoughts and remarks that uh, I would like us to share uh, today. Um, it is indeed encouraging that uh, so many of us uh, have uh, registered to participate in this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it does speak to the importance of the issue that we are discussing uh, today, uh, especially that uh, we are also uh, supported uh, with the assistance of uh, an expert panel of AFI members and key partners. I wish to start from the note that um, through our member needs assessment and other engagements with uh, members, we found that digital onboarding is one of the key challenges uh, highlighted by members in times of the pandemic. Uh, the demand side therefore confirms the high relevance of the topic uh, discussed at this webinar. On our part as AFI, we will address these issues in the context of, of, the, of support of the recovery uh, phase. I therefore encourage all of you to follow closely uh, the activities of our COVID uh, policy response uh, initiative. As you are all aware, most of us uh, are aware that a critical barrier keeping vulnerable population out of the formal financial system is that of verifying their identity. We know that globally, 
1.1 billion people are estimated to lack a legally recognized form of identity, and also an additional 3.5 billion have some form of identity, but critically with no digital trail. The lack of identity has been cited as a barrier to account opening by 45% of those without an account in the Philippines, for instance, and across in sub-Saharan Africa to Zimbabwe, about 49% uh, also attribute uh, a lack of identity uh, to uh, lack of access to financial services. Furthermore, our research at AFI has shown that the traditional loyal customer norms can disproportionately exclude women from the financial uh, uh, system. So digital solutions have the potential to address these gaps. With AFI's, financial, uh, uh, AFI's inclusive fintech strategy that was published at the Sochi G GPF in 2018, emphasizing that digital identity is the basis of a strategy for digital financial inclusion. And even prior to the pandemic, examples from AFI members such as Peru and Malawi highlighted the potential to implement digital ID systems and EKYC regulations at a pace and scale while also ensuring uh, the, the dimension of quality, which is extremely critical uh, to, uh, to co confidence and integrity in the financial system. We also see that uh, digital ID solutions have been tested under controlled conditions in regulatory sandboxes in countries such as Papua New Guinea, uh, Malaysia, and also uh, Mozambique. The shift towards digital customer verification has further been catalyzed by the closure of physical premises in the context of the recent uh, uh, lockdowns uh, that have been uh, uh, that have char characterized the COVID-19 challenge uh, globally. Again, when we go to countries such as India and Thailand, which have invested in digital identity programs and other digital infrastructure such as in the operable payment systems, we see that these have been able to utilize this infrastructure to deliver targeted large-scale fiscal support packages, including to informal sector workers and vulnerable population. And this is absolutely key in times of this uh, pandemic, as you can see, that it is easier to uh, transfer these rescue packages uh, to very structured and bigger enterprises than the informal sector, uh, which in fact has the bulk of the population. Again, this trend towards digital onboarding, if sustained beyond the pandemic, could help us establish a norm whereby paper documentation for KYC starts to become obsolete. This would be a major gain for financial inclusion. This goal can only be achieved through collaborative partnerships to create seamless digital financial services ecosystem. As policymakers, I would employ you uh, to see the need to invest in digital infrastructure and to peer learn on best practices, best technologies, and best uh, uh, policies in implementing your EKYC regimes. The private sector, both established players and new reg tech uh, startups, will need to bring innovative solutions to the table to address design concerns such as accessibility, privacy, and security. The global standard setting bodies are also key. They will need to provide clear guidance on the compatibility of digital identity solutions with global standards for financial integrity. In this regard, the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, recently published a guideline or a guidance on digital ID and a call for such solutions to be fully leveraged in the context of the COVID-19. This provides a use, useful clarity that remote verification solution can be equally or even more effective than physical ones 
to safeguard the integrity of the financial system. I'm pleased, therefore, that uh, the FATF Secretariat has joined us for this webinar today to share their perspective on this important topic. This is an important topic for all of us to address, and I commend the leadership of the Global Standards Personality Working Group and also at the Digital Financial Services Working Group for actually working together to advance the, the policy discussion and peer learning in this field, starting with today's webinar. On this note, I wish all of you a very uh, fruitful discussion. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me to share thoughts on this uh, very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norbert. And thank you so much for that insightful opening. Honored guest, uh, let me introduce our technical moderator for today, Ms. Miriam Zahari. She's AFI's policy analyst. La Zahari, analista de políticas de AFI. Mariam Jimila Zahari. Thank you, Ariadne, and once again, warm greetings to all. To begin, I would like to first provide some context setting in order to situate this topic of digital ID and EKYC for financial inclusion during the COVID-19 response, as well as for the imminent recovery and beyond it within the plenary discussion we will have today. Um, if we could have the slide uh, on context setting, please. As we have all experienced it, almost overnight, there was a renewed reliance on technology and the internet to maintain economic activities that range from access to banking, government social assistance programs being delivered through G2P payments and other critical financial services. And with it, also an increased need for secure, user-friendly ways to verify identities online. Indeed, what is irrefutable is the importance of digital ID and EKYC during a time when movement restrictions have been strictly imposed in order to prioritize the health and well-being of our societies. These mobility restrictions necessitate the EKYC or digital KYC in order to allow for the remote onboarding of new customers, but also to verify the identities of already onboarded customers who had to drastically increase their use of digital financial services. And jurisdictions that had a combination of a national digital ID system and risk-based EKYC regulation before the COVID-19 pandemic struck were able to leverage these in order to accelerate the use of DFS. However, not all of our jurisdictions had the opportunity to develop digital ID systems or formulate EKYC regulation in time. In these cases, there had been an urgency to develop emergency, mostly temporary, simplified KYC and CDD regulations for the response. Additionally, we know that the most vulnerable segments of our populations often disproportionately lack access to any form of ID, whether physical um, or digital, and may be excluded from EKYC measures. These include women, persons with disabilities, and forcibly displaced persons, such as refugees, returnees, and the internally displaced. For instance, even in situations where digital ID is supposed to be able to, uh, to be available to women, social context often prevents them either from obtaining it in the first place or from using it as independently as intended. At the same time, when we are moving towards leveraging digital ID for financial inclusion, we face challenges in policy and regulation, infrastructure, cost, coordination, including regulatory coordination, cybersecurity, data protection, and consumer pr protection, especially for the aforementioned vulnerable segments of our populations. And these challenges are not new. What COVID-19 did was further underline these challenges and stress tested the foundations of our digital financial systems, including our national digital ID systems. Now, when we think about our world post COVID-19, we need to consider the fact that digital ID is evidently critical to advance financial inclusion for our recovery and beyond. With strong digital ID infrastructure, we can build different financial inclusion products and services onto these systems. 
This is towards sustaining the search and the uptake and usage of digital financial services that we have seen during the response. And it is important to align these with regulatory approaches and measures that ensure an inclusive, gender sensitive, stable, safe, and secure financial system that truly leaves no one behind. Thus, it is a great pleasure for us to have such a highly distinguished, diverse panel of experts with us today so that we can address these very pertinent issues. We hope we can draw some parallels in terms of challenges and think about some meaningful next steps for our recovery while we work towards new, fully um, inclusive economy and a better normal for all. Now, before we kick off the plenary discussion, let's do some polling. We would like to ask you to kindly participate in the polling so that we can do a little bit of a temperature check of how you view the topic, including your experience of challenges in leveraging digital ID and EKYC for financial inclusion. So I'd like to ask my colleagues to put up the polling questions, please. All right, so only a small number of you think digital ID um, is playing an important role in driving financial inclusion through DFS during COVID-19. All right, last chance to vote. Okay, we can stop it now. Okay, 79%, so that's a majority. Can we have the next question, please? What type of EKYC has your institution mandated to enable digital financial services? So you can choose more than one. Okay, so almost 50% uh, have no EKYC mandated yet. Um, and video KYC seems to be quite rare amongst you. So uh, can we have the third question, please? What is the largest hindrance towards the adoption of digital ID in your jurisdiction? Again, a multiple choice question. All right, so the 
Okay, so lack of infrastructure um, and access to internet, good address system seems to be um, very high up there. Also, limited consumer awareness and education on the consumer side um, and lack of regulatory coordination. So these are not so surprising at all because um, it, these are exactly the challenges that come up during our working group meetings and also other policy fora where we have discussed digital ID actually for, for a couple of years now. Um, if we can have the last question, please, Amelia. What demography um, in your country faces barriers to obtaining formal identity? So rural communities, um, a majority, definitely. Possibly displaced persons, migrants. Um, but rural communities uh, is something, uh, is also um, a target population that usually is highlighted uh, when we discuss um, lack of identification um, or documentation um, already. So just physical uh, documents for ID. Um, as, a, um, as a barrier to financial inclusion. All right, thanks. So we can end the polls now. So thank you so much um, for completing the polls. Those were interesting, but not very surprising um, results. So we'll be taking your responses into consideration while we steer the plenary discussion. Um, if we can just um, share the results before we kick off the plenary discussion. All right, let's end the polls. Um, and let's begin the plenary discussion. May I request you once again to join us in welcoming our speakers virtually. We have Mr. Ramizul Islam from the Bangladesh Bank, Mr. Yuri Boshor from the Central Bank of Russia, Mr. Marcelo Bellini Garcia from Mastercard, Ms. Shana Krishnan from the Fatah Secretariat, and last but certainly not least, Ms. Kate Eagle from IDEMIA. Welcome again, distinguished panelists. I would like to begin the discussion by hearing from the experiences of our member central banks on the panel, specifically Ramizal and Yuri, your unique experiences in leveraging digital ID and EKYC during the COVID-19 response, including the enablers and challenges in doing so. Ramizal Bai, if you don't mind, we could start with the Bangladesh Bank experience. Okay, uh, thank you, Mariam, and welcome all the panelists and uh, participants. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, so, uh, it is a good opportunity for me to share our experience during the COVID-19. Uh, actually, Bangladesh is a very different country from the uh, rest of the other countries of the world. Uh, last two months, Bangladesh faced a devastating cyclone, Ampan, and two tornado attacks in two different districts. So it is a natural disaster in my country. But the COVID-19 pandemic, however, is a crisis of completely different magnitude and one that will require a response of unprecedented scale. A number of death toll till today is 1,049, and it is increasing day by day. So before uh, starting, I'd like to uh, quote a... American authors Andrew King, uh, his observation that 
we are surviving through this pandemic because of technology. Uh, everyone is sitting at home and their window uh, to the world is through their smartphone. This is rightly uh, speaking by the, that author. In fact, uh, the pandemic offers us an unparalleled window of opportunity to accelerate the uh, adoption of digital solution uh, to drive financial uh, inclusion. So let's start with the EKYC. Actually, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, BFIO uh, in last uh, January 8 uh, uh, issued the guidelines for EKYC after a long time of uh, uh, submitting the, uh, their experiences. So Bangladesh uh, Financial Intelligence Unit worked since 2017 uh, to test the viability of EKYC in Bangladesh. Therefore, the working group has uh, com uh, completed a uh, hands-on nationwide pilot project on EKYC for three months and participated by 18 banks and one non-bank financial institution. This pilot project covers customers onboarding using biometrics and different technologies while customers identity was checked by using national identification card uh, issued by National Identity Registration Wing of Election Commission. And the technologies that used in this pilot project was fingerprint uh, devices, uh, face matching devices, artificial intelligence, optical character recognition, and uh, the language is both... Aussi, uh, et donc en deux in in this pilot, otras. the average rate of successful onboarding has been found to be higher for fingerprint technology than the facial match technology. And uh, the feedback from the, the organization that uh, I piloted, uh, that onboarding for uh, the KYC can be save time on onboarding customer from uh, four to five days to five to six minutes. And cost of uh, customer onboarding and KYC reduces five to 10 times. And the growth of business uh, is around 25% compared to the traditional onboarding and KYC mechanism. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, base of this EQIC is the, actually the uh, digital ID. So before 2008, Bangladesh has no any uh, ID system. And that time actually we had a functional ID that is paper-based for the uh, voter, uh, voting purposes. But from 2008, we are uh, uh, using an ID, which is uh, semi-digital, I will say that because it captured only the four finger uh, uh, pins and uh, 13 uh, um, digit uh, uh, ID. And we are, ex we are experiencing a fraudulent activity uh, um, uh, much that time uh, by using this ID. Later on, uh, our authority, especially the government, uh, the initiative to introduce the smart national ID card. And this is a dramatic change of our um, uh, identification process. But the project not yet finished. So almost for uh, more than 40 percent uh, adults they get the smart id card but thing is that we did one thing we are not uh, wait for the smart national id card both the card is activated and uh, in the ekyc uh, uh, reason both cards are uh, permissible for the uh, onboarding the customers that is the previous one that is uh, four finger yes, uh, fingerprint ids and also the smart Hola, representant Le de quatre doigts. Is, uh, 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 10 fingerprint ID card and uh, 20 different um, uh, security characteristics in three tires is there. And a uh, picture of Irish is incorporated there. And biometrics and photos in, uh, is in electronic format. So uh, a, a smart ID card is uh, really a comprehensive one. And we reduce our food and activity. So, during our e implementation of EKYC, uh, all the banks uh, and uh, MFS uh, position, they are um, using this uh, uh, smart NID as well as the um, uh, previous uh, ID card for the onboarding of the customers. Uh, so uh, we introduced these uh, guidelines uh, in the time of uh, January, just after two months later in March 8, we uh, identified the first COVID case. Uh, so it is a good privilege for us uh, to uh, introduce the uh, KYC perfectly because that time uh, everyone is the uh, lockdown and social distancing is there. So policy, uh, introduction of the policy that is effective one because uh, of the EQIC. So Bangladesh government has uh, uh, taken different initiatives uh, uh, because of the 
uh, COVID-19. So uh, first uh, COVID-19 policy is uh, issued in uh, 19 March, but uh, government has different uh, stimulus packages, uh, like one package is, the, is for BDT 50 billion, which is at approximately US dollar 595 million for the export oriented industries. And this includes assistance uh, towards salaries and funding of two years loan to the factory owners at 2% interest rate. But the government uh, did uh, something uh, innovative one that uh, the salary we, uh, must have to be paid by the uh, MFS, that is mobile financial service uh, account. So uh, at that time, actually everyone is rushed to open the account. So uh, because of the EQIC, everyone can uh, permit to open account by using the, uh, by, by uh, keeping their, themselves at home as well as or going to the agent and uh, or the digital center of the MFS or the banks. So it is permitted. But initiative is one is that before that we tried a lot that the government's uh, salaries should be paid by the accounts or MFS accounts or agent accounts, but it was not workable. But because of the uh, uh, COVID-19, there is no other ways. So this initiative is a very positive one and it uh, uh, lead us to an inclusive uh, uh, economy. And EU also announced a 113 million euro as a grant for the government's workers, those governments which are already locked down and uh, the workers are jobless uh, due to the COVID-19. So they also put uh, this condition that this uh, money uh, also have to uh, deliver by the MFS uh, uh, payment system. So it is an also a, a, a good initiative uh, by the government. And also government has uh, some cash incentive, uh, cash aid uh, uh, for the uh, poor families. So government announced a disbursement package for uh, 12,500 uh, 12, million BDT cash incentive for the poor families. So these hardcore people actually, they have uh, some, uh, might be they have uh, the NID or the birth registration certificate. So this is a question uh, that uh, how they will open the MFS account because the precondition is that that money will be transferred by the uh, MFS account or agent account. So at that time policy, uh, as a policy ah, maker. Uh, uh, okay, pueden acceder is effective only for the NID, but later on we uh, uh, take our, uh, we change our decisions that uh, birth registration certificate also allowed to open the um, uh, uh, MFS account. This is also a dynamic one and uh, uh, the number of accounts jump up uh, just high, rocket, high, high rocketing. One of the MFS provider, uh, they share their experience that part day, that time they open more than 50,000 account, MFS account, uh, 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 either they are the uh, government worker or the poor families. So uh, uh, it also ensured the integrity of the um, uh, financial system. Uh, and also government uh, take the, some initiatives that uh, the no charges will be applied for the cash out of this account. So uh, birth registration, this has also uh, has no any, for, it is not a for ID, but we allowed it for time being but later on might be, we will update these accounts uh, like this way. So uh, because of the uh, effective and you know that um, uh, the EKYC, within these two months, all the banks, they adopt the EKYC technologies and also they apply this uh, technology. And uh, uh, by this way, actually, um, uh, they uh, uh, accommodate all the um, uh, uh, distance peoples to open the, account so that they can uh, it is ensured that uh, all the cash incentives or salary they can uh, get it uh, so these are the some of the uh, the uh, 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 development in uh, my country uh, regarding the covid 19 and one thing is that uh, the uh, id this is a very easy system nowadays anyone can online apply for national id so no any hassle to uh, get the id but there are some uh, barriers so why some people, they do not have the ID. Some are the, because uh, they are the women, they are very reluctant to obtain an ID. Might be some reasons that uh, the cultural reasons might be there. So uh, government and other agencies, they are trying to uh, accommodate how uh, the rate of ID can be um, increased. So government announced in our law that without national ID, they will not get some types of facilities like opening the bank account, uh, 
doing the high volume uh, transactions, uh, getting the insurance uh, policy. So these types of facility, even they cannot get married without a national ID. So these are the initiatives taken by the government so that everyone get the digital ID. And uh, that's all I think I can share some more later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramiz Obai. And, and definitely, I'm sure um, the audience will have some questions for you later on. Um, Yuri, what was it like uh, from the Central Bank of Russia experience? Yuri, are you with us? Yeah, excuse me. That's all right. Uh, okay, uh, thanks again. Uh, I want to tell you about the, how the epidemic situation uh, streamlines the digital services in Russia uh, because the, um, some, uh, some services increasing, some services became uh, more uh, popular. And uh, uh, at first, I, tell, I will tell this uh, digital accessibility of financial services for the population is one of the priority areas of development in uh, modern realities, uh, especially in, in, in Russia too. There uh, is a large number of programs, national projects, uh, and other government initiati initiatives in the Russian Federation aimed to develop the digital env environment in all economy, in all country. Bank of Russia uh, adds parts of part of economy, uh, working to increase the accessibility of digital financial services uh, at first, and uh, it's included as a part of the financial inclusion strategy uh, for the period 2018-2020. Et les deux priorités goals de la stratégie sont d'augmenter le niveau de la stratégie de l'accessibilité et de la qualité dans les zones remotes, sparsely populated et rural, des petites et moyennes entreprises et de nombreux groupes de population avec un accès limité à des services financiers, des groupes de low income, des personnes avec des disabilités, des uh, impairments de la population et d'autres. And the second direction is increase the speed and quality of access to international to financial services for the population with access to the internet. And uh, the mm, sparsely uh, populated and rural area, it's a very big concern for us because the, it's necessary to increase the financial inclusion uh, in this area in, uh, as a priority for us. Uh, the uh, pandemic uh, has limited people opportunities to receive uh, various services uh, in traditional way by visiting, by visiting financial organizations personally. Apparently, such restrictions stimulated the development of the digital service sector, including the provision of digital financial services and also promoted the development of uh, digital channels. Uh, sometimes between pandemic was a problem with internet because a lot of people uh, try to use internet uh, to communication uh, when sitting home. At the same time, it should be taken into account that the promotion of digital financial services, the share risk uh, connected with such services is expected to grow the total amount of financial risk. It will also must uh, uh, take it in, into account this. Uh, the transition of, to a fully remote type of interaction uh, with service providers uh, was a measure forced due to COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, people are saying that every cloud uh, has a silver lining. At the same time, uh, we have uh, the many approaches that we using and uh, was, this was implemented and there is as a response for the uh, such exceptional epidemic situation have turned uh, out to the best practices now and uh, will uh, surely be applied uh, on a regular basis after the end of pandemic. As the concept of fully remote interaction with the best possible way correlates the evil accelerating pace of uh, people lives and uh, in critical conditions of a COVID-19 pandemic, not only provide is uh, via viability, but also open up completely new prospects and opportunities, especially for companies who uh, provide the services. 
and uh, show what was in modern alternatives to the usual traditional way of providing uh, and receiving services. Uh, the need to reform many systems uh, that lag be behind the development of digital technologies has uh, ripened long ago. Technology we was almost ready uh, several years, but uh, the epidemic primarily served as a catalyst and the incentive for the information of new and uh, undoubtedly better approach approaches and directions of development in uh, the provision of services, including financial services as many as. Uh, I will uh, give you some examples of what is in progress and what they already done. Uh, first, uh, in Russia we can have big program, the digital economy of Russian Federation. It's national program. It's uh, actively created an infrastructure for provision the services to the population using the digital ID and some kind of digital ID. It's planned to create the, some data mart connected to several state databases, databases and containing the relevant data about each citizen. Uh, is just the data need, needed for the, uh, no, in, in our case, for financial, uh, financial services. Uh, now we plan uh, till the end of year in Moscow region and some other region try to pilot the electronic passports. It's uh, hard to overestimate the benefits of such technology for financial inclusion. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Moscow and Moscow region uh, authorities issued the temporary digital passes for citizens uh, based on SMS or personal uh, QR code issue. The aim, aim of these passes uh, was to support quarantine measures and regulate traffic of citizens going to work and provide citizens, if necessary, to uh, move uh, to make emergency uh, rights during quarantine. After solving some difficulties during the lunch process, implemented and tested effective mechanism of issuing and checking such digital passes was uh, work. And based on this analysis, on this mechanism, it was uh, revealed that many digital technologies with very rapidly worked out during COVID-19 pandemic can be implemented without significant cost into the procedure of issuing and maintaining digital ID. And now, the, uh, till the end of this year, will be pilot in Moscow region. And uh, then, if it will be successful, maybe some kind of digital IT based, based on smartphones. Uh, at present, it's probably uh, mostly a copy of uh, formal ID, but uh, in digital area. And uh, uh, in May, Last May, May 2020, the Ministry of Digital Development, Communication and Mass Media Russian Federation, uh, alongside the Bank of Russia, was launched the digital profile infrastructure. Digital profile is starting from uh, this May, uh, participating in the experiment, gave an opportunity to uh, real clients to provide all necessary data to fill a loan application or take a loan, including, including mortgage, using digital profile system. The service has been implemented, taking into account the necessary data protection measure. Over the past two, over the past two years, Russia created the unified biometric system. Biometric system is uh, uh, dedicated for the remote uh, receiving the financial services. Uh, faster payment system of Bank of Russia launched uh, 28 January uh, 2019. It's set uh, to enable individuals to make instant transfers uh, 24 uh, hours, seven days a week. Uh, and the if amount less than uh, 100,000 rubles, about uh, $1,300, it's uh, payment free of charge for the people. And during the pandemic, it was a very useful opportunity for people to pay, to exchange money. Uh, it's not necessary to leave uh, homes. And also, uh, Bank of Russia uh, take part in development and implementation measures to support the economy. And also, in this case, uh, we use the digital, uh, digital channels to support our small small medium enterprises and, that, uh, and um, uh, to monitor the uh, and uh, control the uh, government help for this uh, kind of economy uh, how many time mariam do i have uh, two minutes or not 
You have one minute. <laughs> okay, it's one minute. Yes, it's just, just <laughs> I, I go to end. Uh, uh, digitalization of financial services, besides the positive economic impact, uh, surely increases the risk of compromising customer data and implemented various uh, fraud schemes. According to this, uh, to this fact, uh, all digital innovation must be uh, accompanied by appropriate reg regulatory measures aimed to uh, protect personal data, which form it uh, considering best international practice. It's also difficult to overestimate the necessity of giving people, people especially the most vulnerable, vulnerable groups, the elderly people, uh, the appropriate, uh, appropriate information and uh, very high uh, importance of financial literacy in this case. So we are also, also thinking about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Um, now that we've heard from um, the two central bank um, representatives uh, on the panel, I'd like to turn to you, Marcelo. Um, we know that Masakan has made great strides in um, leveraging digital ID to advance financial inclusion. Could you please share with us the experience um, during the COVID-19 response and if you had faced any challenges um, in doing so? Thank you, Marian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, very glad to be here today. So uh, MasterCard has stepped up efforts uh, in applying all our assets to identifying ways uh, to make a difference uh, in our markets around the globe. Um, while this topic of COVID-19 response is upon us, uh, we are speaking with governments uh, on the application to aid uh, with many remote use Avec cases. Différentes utilisations, donc à distance. Remote learning and education, uh, remote health services. These all requiring so sound identity services uh, to know who is remote. Uh, further, we are also looking to the application of digital identity for further extension uh, of remote financial services and new cases for remote employee onboarding. Uh, much of this uh, is in flight uh, right now as we speak, uh, with uh, public results is still in front of us. Uh, but to be assured, this is an area center stage uh, for our digital identity business today. Uh, MasterCard has been building uh, the digital identity service for a few years now, uh, and it's based on privacy by design and minimization of data. Uh, and we do believe that it must be a tool uh, to help any individual to be digitally and financially included, independent from the status. Uh, it also makes sense uh, with other initiatives uh, that MasterCard has, such as uh, the MasterCard Center for Inclu Inclusive Growth, uh, where we uh, aim for sustainable and equitable economic growth uh, and financial inclusion. Uh, what we have what we must have in mind is that billions of vulnerable individuals are underserved in their right for identification today. Uh, so one of these groups, just to give an example, are women uh, that maintain household, as it was just said. Uh, and in, in, that, in that sense, uh, the Women in Identity organization uh, has a vision of digital identity solutions built for everyone and built by everyone, uh, addressing gender bias. Uh, so we are we Mastercard are uh, supporting women in identity uh, as a gold sponsor because we do believe uh, in this cause. Uh, we envision a digital identity uh, where individuals will not pay uh, for their digital identities, um, and the system uh, is funded by private corporations uh, willing to trust in in these digital identities, right? Uh, so, we are basing our development on a user-centric, reusable, and collaborative digital identity service uh, that has very strong principles. So, the, the first one uh, that we, we just said is inclusion. So, everyone, independent of the situation, should have a digital identity. Uh, next one is ownership. So, individuals own their personal data and can access it in simple, safe, and secure way. And uh, we are not creating any additional central database uh, with the user data. Uh, we also have to assure confidentiality uh, because the individual must have the right to keep their digital identity data private and only for uh, himself or herself. 
uh, always uh, provide data with consent and share data with consent uh, and uh, uh, explicit actually user consent uh, or permitted by law. Um, also, we believe that individuals uh, must have the choice uh, and the right uh, to choose trusted uh, digital identity providers and be able to opt out uh, whenever they want. Uh, other topic that is uh, uh, very core for this is fair use. So we do believe that digital identity data will be, on, will be used only for legitimate, fair, and no discriminatory purposes. And last but not least, the data rights. So individuals should have the, the right uh, to access, correct, and delete their identity data and the right to recourse if their rights are violated. <clears throat> so what, what we see today is that a few governments around the world will be able to implement a digital identity ecosystem end to end. Uh, and uh, we have to consider that, that it, it is a costly uh, a costly ecosystem demands a specific technical knowledge and a huge implementation effort. Uh, in that sense, collaboration is core, uh, and we expect lots of organizations uh, contributing to such a solution. Uh, this is not something that the private sector can create on their own, and is also something that the government can do on their own either, because there is a collaboration uh, necessity. Uh, recently, the World Economic Forum uh, published a white paper that uh, says that collaboration across the public and private sectors offers the potential to create new models of secure and useful digital identity. Uh, this builds on a commitment to the responsible handling of personal information, uh, giving individuals control over which data is used and how data is used. So business can create solutions. Uh, as, as said before, fintechs, uh, can create solutions, um, uh, large corporations, but ultimately uh, governments must create policies to be able to support digital identity uh, using solid standards and make regulations to give legal value. This is what we just heard. Uh, I bring three examples uh, here that are quite different, uh, but illustrate uh, digital identity across the world. Uh, so earlier this year, the French government and MasterCard uh, have agreed on a four-year partnership for the digital economy. Part of this program is the national digitization of public services. Uh, MasterCard aims to invest to support France by leverage of digital identity and cybersecurity experts, uh, technology and business partners uh, to the government and the private sector. So that is uh, leveraging the usage uh, of digital identity in the country. Another example is uh, with the Republic of North Macedonia that uh, also uh, has an agreement with MasterCard uh, to bring local digital identity uh, and accounts uh, without visiting, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, digital identity re uh, related services uh, to Macedonian uh, citizens. So uh, they can use uh, the digital identity in day-to-day -day activities. So uh, among the first applications uh, that we uh, are providing in Macedonia uh, are the electronic KYC activities to support remote opening uh, for new bank accounts. Uh, so you don't need to visit a branch in person uh, and new prepaid and postpaid mobile phone accounts can be opened uh, using this uh, digital identity. Uh, these efforts uh, recently uh, uh, created digital identity regulations in North Macedonia. Uh, and it also will leverage uh, a broader electronic identification, authentication, and trust services standards uh, based in the European EIDAS uh, that has been also uh, implemented locally. Uh, once, uh, once we launch uh, this service in Macedonia, it will also enable seamless digital interactions between business and government agencies across the region and around the globe. Uh, in Australia, a partnership with uh, Australia Post uh, was done to integrate uh, their existing digital ID solution. Uh, this will expand the ability for Australians to identify themselves uh, easily when accessing services. 
The partnership is a leverage uh, to digital identity in Australia and provide individuals access to a much larger variety uh, of uses, uh, including public and private applications. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I am available for questions later. Thank you so much, um, Marcelo. And you know, if we look at risks, as highlighted in, in the FATA paper that was published last month um, on COVID-19 related money laundering and terrorist financing, which looks at risks and policy responses across different jurisdictions and regions, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely led to heightened MLTF risks, which require effective policy responses um, particularly at a time of operational disruption to the financial sector. So we've heard risks um, uh, being addressed um, related to data protection and, and consumer protection and cybersecurity, as Marcelo um, and our, our two other panelists had mentioned. But I'd like to ask Shana, um, taking into account some of the challenges that have been mentioned um, and the varying country contexts within our network, could you share with us the key recommendations from the recently released part of guidance on digital ID and how these can be carefully considered at the national level while we work towards leveraging digital ID systems for financial inclusion. Hi, Mariam, and uh, hi to everyone out there. Um, I want to thank AFI for asking us uh, to be on this panel. This is a really important topic for the FATF and the, the guidance on digital ID is really um, a big part of our focus on responsible innovation which we believe has um, really an opportunity to make anti-money laundering measures much more effective and to support financial inclusion at the same time. So, so thank you. Um, and we're really glad that we got this um, digital ID guidance, a bit like our colleague from Bangladesh said about their, some of their digital ID systems. We're glad we got this out in March uh, before the pandemic really started to spread across the world because um, it sends a really important message about digital onboarding and digital transactions. Uh, and if there's one thing that you take away from what I say today, it would be this. Um, so the guidance kind of clearly states that, you know, non-face-to-face -face, um, business, either be that uh, onboarding or transactions, are not necessarily high risk and can actually be standard risk or, or lower risk if, um, they're use, if they're using trustworthy digital ID. And it's really important that we, we keep that message in mind because we wanna make sure that the AML CFT requirements aren't, aren't a barrier to financial inclusion, but they're not also a barrier to financial services or aid or economic recovery uh, during this period. So uh, Mariam, you asked me to talk about some of the key recommendations from the digital ID guidance for government. Um, and I'll, I'll try to cover three kind of key things, um, but there, there's a lot more detail in the report itself and in the recommendations. Um, but the first thing I'll say is um, as a starting point um, that governments really need to understand the digital ID ecosystem in their jurisdiction and to really match that up, um, see how that fits with the customer due diligence requirements in the country as well. Um, and that really involves working with um, a wide range of stakeholders. Um, what became really clear to me while I was working on this guidance is that AML CFT um, regulators are not always digital ID experts and you have AML CFT requirements on one side and then digital ID assurance frameworks and technical standards on another side and they use terminology um, and language that's completely different and it seems like kind of two different worlds and the role that we played here was tried to bring some of that terminology, some of those standards together um, so they could be interpreted by the regulators um, and that's important to happen as well on a national level um, and so in government some of the other stakeholders that might be relevant are for example identity framework uh, people that manage identity frameworks in the country, um, people that uh, manage access to government services, um, data protection and privacy agencies, and also competition agencies might also be relevant. There, there might be also others um, depending on your particular circumstances. And then there's also a, a very important point about communicating with the private sector and getting their feedback and input. And this includes both the regulated entities, so banks and other businesses, as well as the digital ID service providers like uh, MasterCard and Adenia, for example. So uh, it's, you know, we've talked about some things like consultative forums. I think in the beginning, um, somebody mentioned regulatory sandboxes and, you know, trying some of the systems out. 
all of this is really important for making sure that we're designing something that can actually work uh, in, the, in the current situation as well. So that was my first point. The second point is about providing regulatory leadership and clarity. Um, and this is a bit of a combination of the digital ID guidance and some of the recent work we've done on COVID-19 um, and some of the responses that countries can take. So we've seen a lot of governments around the world um, being quite proactive and informing, informing the regulated entities about the changing risks, um, when simplifies due diligence is actually possible, um, how to encourage financial inclusion through tiered CDD. And the COVID-19 paper that we've produced actually sets out a whole range of different examples of how regulators have done this. And it's really important um, noting that, you know, also financial institutions and others are also kind of operating at reduced capacity at the moment. Um, that regulatory clarity about what the requirements are, what our expectations are, is really important uh, to ensure that they can kind of respond quickly to the current situation. And then the last point I want to just address is how governments can actually support um, the take up of responsible solutions. So what we've mentioned in the digital ID guidance is the importance of allowing flexibility, but making sure there is a risk based approach in place. So We've seen that you know, different regulators have allowed um, a certain amount of flexibility in the current situation um, and also have done that even if you know, risk assessments, for example, haven't, um, haven't been put in place. But what's important to, to kind of keep in mind is that there are other measures that we can put in place to mitigate the risks. Um, and that, that includes things like ring fencing, some of those accounts that have been developed um, at the current time where you know, if, you know, a full amount of CDD hasn't been able to be carried out. Um, and then continuing to kind of monitor those accounts and make sure that being, they're being used as they're being expected to. Um, and to ensure that other things like transaction limits and et cetera are in place um, to make sure that the, the risks that could be um, uh, relevant there are actually being mitigated, um, even though we're giving access to the financial services. Um, another thing that's important is that, you know, governments could develop mechanisms to promote cost cross industry collaboration. This is relevant in a COVID-19 context, but also a non COVID-19 context. And in some countries, um, we've seen that, you know, governments have developed things like centralized databases of identity of evidence. Um, these sorts of things can start to be um, a starting point for uh, further um, development of digital ID or allowing the private sector to access some of these sorts of information to develop some of their solutions. And lastly, one of the things I want to mention, and this is really from the digital ID guidance, is the role that the government can play in making sure that there are sort of trustworthy certification mechanisms available in the jurisdiction. Uh, and this is really important to, to help the private sector know where um, the trustworthy sources of digital ID are. And I'm really talking about here examples where there are more than one uh, source of digital ID in the country. Um, so this could be the government doing it themselves through you know, a fair and transparent process, being clear what the, the requirements are, or they could be, for example, um, uh, supporting assurance testing and certification by other appropriate um, expert bodies. And that would help hopefully help the private sector have a certain level of comfort that the the products and solutions that they're using are actually reliable and dependent uh, for, for their purposes. One other thing that you'd asked me to address, uh, Mariam, is how do we sustain the momentum going forward? We've seen a lot of um, countries and um, you know, firms embrace these technical, technical solutions. Um, how do we kind of keep that going and make sure that we don't go back to square one um, when everything starts going back to normal? Um, so one of the things I wanna highlight is at first there's probably going to be a period of some caution and reflection um, and reassessing the risk and performance of some of the solutions that have been put in place. This is especially the case where you know countries don't have a, a national digital ID system and they have been using particular solutions uh, to kind of make ends meet. There will be a process of making sure that those solutions you know have, were appropriate considering the MLTF risks uh, yeah, that they're facing. But again, it is important that we don't lose the momentum. This is an incredible opportunity um, to future-proof the AML CFT systems that we have. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that moving forward, supervisors um, of financial institutions and other entities really need to understand the technology 
um, so they can ensure that the, the entities are applying a risk-based approach. Um, and I, I just want to repeat something I actually heard in a webinar yesterday um, that somebody was talking about artificial intelligence technology and saying that that shouldn't be a black box. Um, we should understand the inputs and the outputs that are going into the kinds of technology that we're using. It shouldn't be something that's mysterious. And we need to be able to ensure that, you know, those, the technology that's being used is explainable um, and justifiable and that we understand how it's actually mitigating the risks that we see um, in, in the country. And lastly, uh, I just want to highlight the importance of monitoring the developments in digital ID. I mean, just from hearing uh, the presentations today, we can see that things are moving, uh, you know, very quickly forward. And we've really um, emphasised uh, to governments in our guidance that they need to look at this and see how they can kind of support responsible digital ID systems, both domestically and hopefully one day, you know, across borders as well, um, by continuing to kind of talk and have these discussions at an international level. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Shana. Um, and you know, when we when we look at or think about these risks, um, it is important that we consider also uh, some of the the effective tools that have already been developed to conduct processes such as identity proofing. Um, Kate, it would be really great if you could share Idemia's. Um, system design choices, um, which we know allows customers to completely digitalize the user registration and verification process, but also um, to highlight how um, you still comply or adapt to specific local, local regulations and are compliant to AML CFT regulation, as well as the data protection and privacy rules um, that the other panelists have highlighted. Thank you. Sure. Great, great to be here. Thank you uh, very much for welcoming us. So Idemia has a very long legacy around identity and that's both in terms of physical identity and digital identity um, and both for the government and the private sector. And the platforms that we have have been built around that experience and built around the best practice that we've seen all around the world in very, very different ecosystems. And what we have developed as a system, as a series of the platforms is really based around six quite simple rules. The first of those is adaptability because every ecosystem is different. There are different identity templates, there are diverse regulations, there are differences in terms of the workflows that are required for a specific ecosystem. So we've had to develop the means to adapt our technology to the varying systems. The second point is to be omni-channel. So by that we mean in terms of the technology and in terms of who is providing that channel. So when we talk about technology, that can mean we're enabling enrollment, for example, through mobile phone, but we're also working with agency networks who are enabled with biometric devices, for example, to go to people's doorsteps, especially in rural areas, to onboard people for identity services, whether that's from the private sector or the government. And so this kind of multimodal omnichannel means of getting the technology into the hands of the user is critical. In terms of what that channel is, what we see is different solutions whereby maybe it's government led and the government is enabling a digital identity system within their country, within their ecosystem, that can then be utilised by the private sector, for example, for onboarding for bank accounts. But what we've also seen is where there has been some, some delay for for example, in actually managing to roll that out and reach scale, the private sector is able to step in. And we see this in Africa, in Asia, where the national payment schemes, for example, are actually a little frustrated, perhaps, in that they are unable to meet their financial inclusion targets because the digital identity provided by the government is not being rolled out fast enough for them to then take benefit from that. So then they are able to provide a channel where they are actually, chain, or a system, or to enroll, en nombre del gobierno. enroll the vulnerable, both for that government ID and for their own financial services. So we're seeing this happening further and further. And then the, in the third case, we're seeing that the private sector is able to drive the creation either as individual companies or through consortiums, through an ecosystem-based approach. And we see this, for example, in Scandinavia and the Nordics, where the private sector has really created 
a digital identity system which is universally accepted both by the private sector and as a means of onboarding into government and trusted uh, secure you know tax returns availability of benefits and so on so this kind of omni channel in terms of the technology and how it's reaching the end user is key when we talk about interoperability so we as Idemia we work with the private sector to really enable identities that can benefit from all of the different ways of proving and validating an identity so whether that's a route of trust check against a government database where that's existing or whether it's using the other attributes that an ecosystem can offer, which might be the attributes from a mobile operator, from a credit reference agency, from an insurance company, and so on and so on. So for us, interoperability is, is critical in terms of being able to create a framework that you can build on in terms of where this validation is coming from. And in parallel, we work with the governments to, to really push them to think through their system design as supporting the interoperability of the third parties. So to make sure that the private sector can really use a government issued digital identity for the purpose of financial inclusion. And we're asking them, okay, you might want a civil registry for your own purposes, but how can we really use this to drive digitization and financial inclusion so digital inclusion financial inclusion insurance inclusion and so on and so forth so when we talk about ecosystems we've our system has been designed in order to support an ecosystem whether that's private led or whether that's government led and however many different players that has to incorporate in order for it to be a full ecosystem but we've also had to create something that is modular so that we can pick up the Lego bricks that are needed for any particular case. So in order to sustain the adaptability that I mentioned at the beginning, we have to be able to just plug and play certain elements of this solution. And that's the way that we've designed it so that we're, in it, we're able to do that. When we talk about, about compliance, uh, again, this is something that's going to be particular for a jurisdiction and particular for regulation. When we talk about AML and uh, counterfinancing of terrorism, we have an architecture which allows, for example, that we can screen an individual against an external or a government watch list uh, for, for that particular jurisdiction. And that's something that we see an increasing request for and an increasing need for. Um, and then when the final of the six elements, of course, is around privacy and control and consent. And this is something that must be considered at the beginning. How are you defining a digital identity for privacy and for consent? How are you building those consent mechanisms in? How are you obtaining the trust of the user for them to feel comfortable in providing that data and feeling like they have control of that data? So for us, these six kind of rules, the adaptability, having the omnichannels, having the interoperability, being modular, having the ability to be compliant to flexible regulations and needs of a certain jurisdiction, and designing for privacy and consent are critical. Um, in terms of what we see the regulator as being able to do and what we would like to have the regulators have in mind, and the key considerations is how you can support digital financial services through regulation. And when we talk about KYC, of course, that opens up the, the question about, around risk-based approaches. <coughs> Excuse me. So as a technology vendor, we can, we can work with whatever documentation we're requested to work with, um, whether it's one particular digital um, national identity or a series of documents. So for example, in India, we work with, I believe it's 32 different proof of address that are accepted by the system. So those decisions around which documents to accept as a means of identity verification are not our choice. Our system has to be able to cope with the decisions that are being made as to what is acceptable. And what we see as being really successful in terms of financial inclusion and digital inclusion in general 
is having the risk-based and the tiered-based approach. So what we call a level zero, which can start purely with biometrics. And then you can build on that, whether it's with a proof of address, whether it's with different levels of trust that are built into different documents that can be accepted. So if we look at some of the examples that exist around the world, so in Mexico, there's a tiered scheme for deposit accounts where you can have a very low value accounts, which has got very basic KYC. And then the KYC is increasing progressively as the restrictions on that account are being removed. India has got a zero balance account called uh, Dan, uh, Jandan, which allows deposits up to a certain limit and allows you to receive, most importantly in the, in the COVID context, receive government grants and subsidies. And that's based on a very, very basic KYC. And again, as you want to utilize that account, as you want to utilize those financial services further, the requirements for how you're verifying yourself can increase. And these are the things that, that really, really are so, so critical in terms of creating digitization for those that haven't been addressed using the more traditional methods, let's say. And the other message really for regulators is around understanding the technology. And I think this was mentioned a little bit earlier earlier that it's for us I think it's really really important that regulators are are making steps to understand what is available to them and what technology progressions are happening because it's happening and it's happening quickly so for example I mean there's biometrics there's remote document authentication there's passive liveness so that you can make sure that the person on the other end of the phone is alive and it's not a photograph there are things like behavioral or biometrics where you can you know establish whether someone is operating under duress for example there's a whole host of different technologies around machine learning and ai that companies such as idemia hey, and sorry, Pete, others yeah uh, we'll just need to ask you to um, um finish up yeah of course i am finishing up don't worry <laughs> and that was that was my final point was, was hey, right. take advantage of the fact that we're here we're, we're very very open to talking about technology that we have and helping you to understand how it can really push you in the direction of your targets. So that was, I was wrapping up on that point anyway. So, <laughs> Well, that, that was a great wrap up, I think. Thank you so much, um, Kate. And uh, we're, we're almost out of time. So we're going to go straight to um, questions from the audience. Um, so to our dear audience, you can type your questions using the Q&A function, or you can raise your hand in order to verbally ask uh, your question to the panelists. Um, we'll be monitoring those and directing them um, to the panelists accordingly. Uh, we'd also like to ask for an additional five minutes from you uh, so that we can do a quick uh, conclusion um, to, to sum up the session. Uh, I think, Mariam, I have one question from Nafisa Usman. Yes. To me. So can I... That's uh, right. uh, can I yes. uh, answer this question? Yes, of course, please go ahead, but I'll ask the question um, so that the, the audience knows uh, what's, what's um, been asked of you. So um, since Bangladesh is a country that has been prone to natural disasters like this pandemic, um, it, they believe you have been using BFS as a priority element in protecting physical and financial systems in, in the country. Can you categorically answer if DFS has a positive or negative implication in fighting MLTF in Bangladesh? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Nafisa Osman, for your questions. So, uh, okay. Uh, of course, uh, DFS or MFS by using uh, this uh, platform, uh, we have a very positive uh, role to fighting the ML and TF. So, when we formulate any uh, policy, like EKYC or other policies. Uh, in that case, we always uh, try to accommodate all of the FATF uh, recommendations. Suppose if I give them an example uh, that in the, in the EKYC guidelines, we uh, apply the recommendation one, that is risk space approach, recommendation six, that is targeted financial section, so sanction screening. So whether it is a simplified account or regular account, they have to have uh, go to for the screening of the, uh, the person and also the customer due diligence. Uh, there is recommendation 10 that is uh, 
uh, when anyone uh, come onboarding uh, the customer, that time they have to identify as well as uh, verify the customer. Because earlier, it was uh, quite impossible for our banking system uh, <clears throat> to verify the uh, customer. But now it is as all the um, financial institution have MOU with election commission. So immediately they can verify the NID. So that uh, my recommendation also purposefully full. And <clears throat> uh, uh, recommendation 11 is the record keeping. That is all the records uh, they have to keep electronically uh, so that um, uh, data cannot be breached or shared with the other persons. And if a, uh, uh, regulators like uh, BFIU, uh, if asked for any data, they have to give it uh, 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 promptly, uh, no any doubt. And uh, the recommendation 20 is the reporting of suspicious transactions. So we have a very um, uh, reporting ecosystem so that uh, if uh, there is uh, taken place any uh, food and activity or ML or TF activity, immediately they have to report it to uh, BFIU and BFIU take the necessary action. So earlier, actually, uh, as the, uh, uh, everyone has the uh, imagination that as the low value transaction in the MFS or DFS, so it is a less risky. But later on, we find out that uh, no, uh, it might be a risky one. So we identified a digital uh, hundi activity or uh, any other fraudulent activity. So that types of activity we find out. So we have a very ecosystem for the reporting uh, purposes. So. Uh, there is a lot of um, uh, MLTF cases uh, in the um, uh, MFS, uh, but uh, very few cases of the TFS, uh, TF. So like this way, we handle these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ramizol. Um, we also have a question for Marcelo uh, from one of the participants. Uh, they ask, users should have choice and rights, which includes the right to opt out. Could you elaborate on what you meant um, by opting out? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So, um, in the in the context of a collaborative environment for digital identity ecosystem, uh, we we understand that the user first must have the right uh, to be able to issue such a digital identity from uh, different parties or from multiple parties. So, uh, this is the first right to be able to choose uh, where uh, or what trusted. Uh, digital identity provider the user wants to use to, to have such a digital identity. So in that context, uh, we also believe that the user must have the right uh, to opt out uh, from this trusted digital identity provider uh, and, uh, and have uh, uh, all the guarantee that the data uh, will remain private uh, and can be, uh, can be uh, <coughs> and he can uh, issue the digital identity in another trusted provider. It, does it answer the question? I believe so. I believe that um, answered the question very well. Thank you. Um, I think uh, thank Shana you. has, thank you. Shana has to um, leave us soon, um, but I think uh, Shana, you've managed to, to um, highlight some of the, the forward looking um, uh, recommendations that we can consider. So we'll, I'd like to just thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and if, if they have any other additional questions, we'll be directing them to you um, beyond the webinar. Uh, just one last question um, to both Kate um, and Yuri, since uh, they haven't um, had the second round yet. Um, Yuri, in your experience, um, what would your recommendation be for regulators who um, would like to work more closely with the private sector in order to leverage digital ID for financial inclusion from a regulator, regulator's perspective. Ah, he's on mute. Yuri, you need to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please repeat the last part of the question because I'm not here, something was wrong with communication. That's okay. Uh, the question was, um, what would your um, recommendation be to the financial regulators here um, on how um, they can better collaborate with the private sector in order to leverage digital ID for financial inclusion? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, let me first, um, for example, if we um, choose, if we uh, consider the uh, biometric identification system, 
it's I think it's very good uh, example of uh, collaboration between private and the state because uh, the um, I'm not uh, special in this area because the technology is not uh, this technology not my area of our responsibility but uh, during the um, uh, putting data in the state biometric system and um, compare the person with this system uh, to providing the uh, authentication and identification. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about number, uh, seven or eight private company. Each company developed its own uh, algorithm of biometric um, data uh, comparing. And this algorithm is in independent and all these companies uh, uh, made uh, their own uh, independent decision. So in this case, practically impossible to uh, influence on this decision because it's uh, different companies with different algorithms, different security systems. And if somebody wants to uh, to, to, to use the, some fraud uh, for personal data, it's practically impossible. So I think it's very good example for collaboration between private and state in the, uh, the digital ID and the bi uh, state biometric system at uh, some step uh, towards the uh, digital ID. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yuri. Uh, and Kate, uh, the question uh, we have from, for you is actually from the audience. Um, the, the question that was asked was, uh, we seem to assume that every rural poor has a digital mm -hmm. device. How can we digitally include more people with uh, lack of digital access, like the mobile phone? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And it's something that we've, we've had to deal with in, in various projects that we've done around the world. And Adhar is obviously... Uh, a very large scale reference where we worked with bank, banking consultants, so agent networks, uh, to really go out with devices and onboard people on their own doorstep using those device, devices and then create an approach where they can then not only onboard for those financial services but use those financial services so they can then re authenticate themselves on that device to that agent who is a member of their own village to make a deposit make a withdrawal apply for insurance etc and uh, not only India this is something that's becoming increasingly commonplace across Africa um, and that's that's one example where you can have some some you take you take the technology to the individual if they don't have it but this this approach of omni channel where you can have a solution that is allowing onboarding and authentication across the web, mobile phone, using devices, using kiosks, using devices within branches or sub-branches is, is highly important uh, so that you can facilitate choice. But for the very, very rural, uh, we've seen a huge amount of success using these consultancy networks, uh, banking consultant or bank agent networks, which are already there. And a lot of the mobile and network operators have these people already in place. So if you look at um, how mobile operators are onboarding people from the very rural areas, quite often they're sending people to have these you know, small kiosks on the corner of a street. So these networks are already in place and they can be better utilized if they're enabled using the right technology. So hopefully that answers. Thank you, Kate. Um, uh, well, I, you know, we, we've definitely run out of time now, and uh, well, I thought that was really excellent, the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Ramizul, uh, Yuri, Marcelo, um, and Kate. Shana's gone now. Um, I would like to invite um, Sally to make the conclusion, to the con closing remarks, in order to conclude the session um, and uh, provide us with some key takeaways that, that she's, uh, she's uh, caught up from, caught from uh, the discussion. Sally, over to you. Thank please. you, Mariam. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank AFI Management for availing such interaction and knowledge sharing options among AFI members through such webinars as part of their COVID-19 response measures as well. Also, thank you to our esteemed panelists for a lively and enlightening discussion on the role of digital identity and EQIC in the policy response to COVID-19 and beyond. 
uh, of course, an extended thanks to all the participants across the AFI network, as well as to our partners for joining today's webinar and for your questions and active participation. The, discussion, the discussions have shown that developments in digital identity infrastructure and EQIC policies and regulations present a tremendous opportunity to reduce frictions I'm sorry, can you hear me? We can Hello. hear you now, Sally, yes? Uh, in customer onboarding and catalyzing financial inclusion in the process. The conversation has also highlighted that the COVID-19 pandemic has proved the essential need to support the rollout, the rollout of digital ID systems to facilitate preparedness for future crises. The challenge now will be to Somebody. Tenemos ahora de servicios financieros. This will require addressing concerns such as privacy, security, consumer trust and cons consent, the accessibility for vulnerable groups. Some key points highlighted in the discussion actually included the roles of different players, including the uh, standard setting bodies in availing ecosystems, the government in their readiness and the readiness to invest in infrastructure and validation of data. The regulators, which have to work on securing cybersecurity and data privacy, setting policy directions and regulations, initiate uh, initiatives and projects that would help into achieving uh, digital identity and also work towards building up the capacity of different involved stakeholders. The financial services providers who have to adapt to systems initiate partnerships with uh, the private sector and uh, make sure that they are more agile and more ready to, for uh, offering their services with digital identity and EQIC. The private sector also, as highlighted within many of the uh, panelists' discussions, play a crucial role within the digital identity and EKYC offerings, whether large corporates of, or fintechs who would definitely offer the solutions and boost the technology towards achieving such projects. They have to also be uh, agile and adaptable towards the systems and the regulations set in place and the jurisdictions they work in. Infrastructure also is a very key component, whether to have national ID systems, to face technology challenges, which are variable according, based on a lot of uh, uh, variables like demograph demographies, like the poll, we have seen that in rural areas, maybe it's more challenging to include people and to have KYC of people and to have and to issue IDs, national IDs for people. So we have to make sure that uh, infrastructure is there and it, that it is adaptable to all kinds of variables as well. The level of awareness of the customer is also a key to uh, make sure that digital identity and KYC is used and is well perceived and um, all the efforts that will be done through whether governments, uh, regulators or financial services providers or the private sector will be properly implemented. We have to deal with the customer's fears, we have to deal with their perceptions and we have to deal with their needs as well. We have to offer them incentives. Like for example, when uh, Mr. Ramzul Islam talked about Bangladesh uh, experience where he said that digital onboarding has reduced the time from five days to five minutes for opening accounts. This would definitely serve as the incentive that uh, Mr. Yuri has talked about uh, during his, his presentation when he said that in Russia, maybe the technology was there a long time ago, but they needed the proper incentive to make people use this technology. And here the COVID-19 came as such incentive to push the people towards uh, 
full dig digitization, or I'll, I'll quote him, he said, fully remote interaction, which is brilliant. In Egypt, actually, uh, after, as part of the COVID-19 response measures we have taken is that we allowed digital onboarding or online onboarding for mobile wallets uh, customers, which was not allowed before the COVID-19. And this has showed, of course, rapid increase in the uh, ability of people to use uh, digital payments. Moving forward with the Global Standards Proportionality Working Group, we will be incorporating this topic into our work plan, including with the support of our colleagues from the Digital Financial Services Working Group and from our partners in the private sector, as well as the FATF and regional bodies, to conduct further peer learning and knowledge sharing activities and to develop case studies and guidance on good practices. I will not take further of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining our discussion today. And whilst we cannot meet in person, we hope to see you again soon in upcoming AFI webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. And thank you once again to all our panelists um, and everyone who uh, made the time to join us today during the, the webinar. Um, with that, we officially close uh, the session. And um, while you jump out of the session, we'd like you to um, please um, participate in the short survey that uh, we're showing on the screen um, so that we can uh, receive your evaluations of the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Kate, Maria, Thank you, and Marcelo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's great having you on board. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good uh, evening. Thanks for inviting us. Have a good Hello. day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.